Thanks very much indeed, Alan. Um, our final speaker this evening is Dr. Eve Morrison. Uh, Dr. Morrison studied history at Trinity College Dublin, and she's recently uh, completed a doctorate under the supervision of Professor David Fitzpatrick at Trinity entitled The Bureau of Military History, Separatist Veterans, Narratives of the Irish Revolution. And her focus this evening, she tells me, will be on the testimonies of Northern veterans of the Anglo-Irish War or War of Independence. So, Dr. Eve Morrison. Okay, um, so the first two speakers have really gone through basically the more straightforward history. And what I'm gonna talk about um, is, is really so one of the, one of, a very important source for that history that's come out in recent years. Um, the Bureau of Military History was founded by the Fianna Fáil government in January 1947 to collect personal testimonies and documents from separatist veterans of the military ring of the Irish independence struggle. It would be former members of the Irish Volunteers, the IRA, Common Amon, Fianna Aaron, the Irish Citizen Army. And they also took a smaller number of, of statements from people involved in the, in the political side of the separatist campaign. Uh, the project operated uh, for a decade, uh, closing in December 1957, but the statements weren't released until March 2003. So, and I'll begin by just making a few brief observations about the overall characteristics of the material before looking in more detail uh, at the Northern statements. Um, now, basically the Bureau, over the time that it was operating, uh, interviewed 1,620 individuals or witnesses and they gave 1,773 witness statements. The overwhelming majority of them were with former officers of the, of the Irish Volunteers and IRA, both pro and anti-treaty. Relatively few ordinary volunteers were asked to give statements and just 135 women gave testimonies. The vast majority of those were from Cumann Amon. And now, the, also, the overwhelming majority of Bureau witnesses uh, were Catholic, although the collection also contained statements from a number of Protestant Republicans, such as Alf Cotton, uh, Bulmer Hobson, Elizabeth Bloxham, Ernest Blythe, and Rory Haskins. Haskins stands out particularly because he was a former member of both uh, the UVF uh, and the Orange Order. Now, uh, there were uh, 352 statements discussed the 1916 Rising only, uh, and almost 1,300 statements, uh, witnesses gave statements that also included the period after 1916 up to the truth, July 1921. Uh, and some 244 of these also discussed the period after the truce, the 1922-1923 period, though not always a great length. Officially, the Bureau didn't take statements about the Civil War because it was considered divisive, but in practice they did. And it's these, these statements uh, for this later period that I'm going to uh, concentrate on. Now, regionally, uh, the statements were, taken from, statements were taken from veterans in every county in Ireland, Ireland, but the Bureau concentrated in particular on areas that have been most active. And as you can see, the bulk of statements were taken in Leinster and Munster, and many of these from just two counties, which are Cork and Dublin. But in its entirety, the Bureau collection provides a unique record of a national independence struggle and contains more information about the organization and conduct of the military wing of the separatist movement in the early 20th century than I think any other source currently available to historians. Um, and used carefully and in conjunction with other sources, I think they provide real insight into Irish separatism as, as it was actually lived and experienced on the ground. Whereas before we only had a few published memoirs by separatist veterans, there are now hundreds of personal accounts. Um, and so I suppose to describe the statements as a source in a nutshell, um, they, though they don't conform to modern oral history, what would be understood as modern oral history today, they have all the characteristics of oral testimony, and I think are best approached that way as, as oral sources. Um, and so if you're going to look at them, I think it's, it's, it's good to do so with a good knowledge of the methodology and practice of oral historians, um, particularly as they're experts at dealing with retrospective testimony, and they're very well informed about the nature of autobiographical memory. Um, now, overall, the Bureau statements have an operational focus, you know, pretty narrow operational focus that was very typical of military history as it was understood in the 1940s and 50s when the statements were taken. They tend to concentrate on formal military actions, the IRA organizations. In other words, what they did, how they did it, how many guns they had. Um, now, military history has changed a lot since then. Um, and some historians find this particular characteristic of, of the, the witness statements frustrating. Uh, 
Um, but even so, when approached on this level, they, they often contain very interesting information. For instance, when I, for, when I read, uh, the first started reading the statements, I came across a few kind of passing references to the fact that the IRA sometimes bought some of their guns from the UVF, right? The, basically, the way, you know, there's a lot about how they acquired their, their uh, arms, and they were basically from stealing them or buying them. And so when I first, I was quite surprised when I came across the, this reference to buying guns from the UVS and I, and UVF, and I didn't believe it. But it was then, it started to be mentioned by a few more witnesses. And, and later, as I started to contextualize the material, I found, an, uh, I looked at another set of inter interviews done with Northern Witnesses that was carried out later in the 1960s by Father Lewis O'Kane. And a veteran in that collection said much the same and gave much more specific uh, information about it. And he contrasted the pre and the post Great War UVF and said that, that basically, after uh, the Great War, that the UVF was, was quite different than it had been before, and it was from them that they tended occasionally to buy some of the guns. Now, I don't know how often this happened, but I think there probably is some truth to it, um, particularly because by the time that I had read all of the Bureau statements and then cross-checked them against British accounts and other sources, it was clear that this sort of dealing between enemy combatants wasn't actually that unusual. And on the whole, in particular, uh, the attitude of British soldiers towards the IRA and vice versa could be remarkably ambiguous and there was considerable evidence that individual British soldiers who were willing to sell rifles and ammunition were among the best source of arms the IRA had throughout uh, the War of Independence and across uh, the island of Ireland. Um, now, to move on more specifically to the statements from the North, there's 130 statements from the nine northern counties, um, and this makes up about, as you can see here, just 8% of the total number of, of interviewees. Um, now, but I would argue certainly that these statements still make a real contribution to knowledge and are comparable, I think, really to the interviews of Monaghan veterans carried out by Lawrence Marin and Potter Livingston in the 1960s, and these were used uh, very effectively by Fergal McGarry in his biography of Owen O'Duffy, and he was talking about he was reconstructing the, the War of Independence in Monaghan. Um, and the thing is, there are other sets of interviews with separatist veterans. They're either very hard to access or they contain very little information about the North. The Father Lewis O'Kane interviews, for instance, are mostly on reel-to-reel -reel tape and only a few of them been have been transcribed. And the, uh, Ernie O'Malley did, uh, carried out his own interviews around the same time of the Bureau. But out of some 450 veterans, he interviewed just 12 uh, Northern Republicans. Um, now, about 79 of the Bureau witnesses from the North uh, were from what is now Northern Ireland, uh, and about 70% of these uh, talked about the period after 1916. Now, I don't have a, a time really to give a comprehensive overview, so uh, what I'll make, just talk about a little bit about what makes them distinctive, and then give a couple of examples from the statements that I thought were particularly interesting um, so, right, one of the most important, I think, and distinctive characteristics of Northern Irish witnesses was that 60% of them were living elsewhere when they gave statements, the majority in Southern Ireland. And the pe percentage varied from uh, county to county. And the figure from Antrim, as you can see, is much higher with about 87% of Bureau witnesses from there having left uh, Northern Ireland were living in the South. And I think this, kind of, this reflects the exodus of IRA men from the north uh, after, after 1922. Now this is a great contrast to the south, for instance, where 90% uh, in of Dublin witnesses, bureau witnesses, were still living in Dublin, and 86% 86 of Cork witnesses were still in Cork. Um, and in general, I think part of the reason for this is that, is that interviewing separatist veterans still resident in Northern Ireland presented uh, more difficulties in, in the South. The IRA was a banned organization under the Civil Authority Special Powers Act um, and say for instance awarding military service pensions or the southern government awarding military service pensions to northern volunteers have been problematic as, uh, as the police intercepted and copied MSP applications because it was proof of IRA membership. And separatist veterans in Northern Ireland were generally much more wary of associating themselves with the Bureau and generally Bureau investigators were noticed by the authorities and Northern witnesses were often reluctant to use the telephone or the postal service because they were afraid that the authorities would discover that they had been associated at one time with the separatist movement. So Bureau investigators often met witnesses in the house of local priests and they requested that acknowledgement of their statements received sh shouldn't be sent to their home address. 
And then in, in October 1954, after the OMA, the IRA's raid on the OMA military barracks in which five British soldiers were wounded, uh, the Bureau's director, Michael McDumphrey, suspended operations in Northern Ireland, though several statements were still unfinished. Um, so, but we do have a certain number of statements, and that's the, the ones in black are, are the, the number of statements from each of the county. Um, now, the, and I think the other really distinctive thing about these statements was that the number of statements uh, that actually deal with the period outside the official guidelines of the Bureau, which was the period 1922-23, is much higher among Northern statements uh, than, it, than it is elsewhere. Um, as you can see, some 65% of statements from Northern Ireland cover, with this, cover this period. Uh, and, you, and that's, say for instance, in, in Connacht there was only 4% and in Munster 16. In, in the sense, so something like 65% of Northern veterans talked about uh, the truce and civil war period. Um, now, I think w one very important reason for this was because the principal investigator in the North uh, and also the Bureau member who made the most significant contribution to how the Bureau's methodology developed was John McCoy, who is himself a veteran of the 4th Northern Division and he'd been Frank Aiken's adjutant. Now, his own Bureau statement ends in 1924 and he argued that basically that ending in July 1921 20 when you're interviewing Northern witnesses made little sense. Um, now, Bureau accounts for the 1919 to 23 period have been mined very effectively already by historians like Robert Lynch and A.C. Hepburn. Um, and the statements generally confirm that in some areas of the North, the IRA did very little until the truth period. And in general, the treaty split and civil, civil war had a disastrous impact on the Northern IRA, which was already much weaker and had much less popular support in the South. Um, and as, as we can see, just in terms of what actually happened in the North compared to the South was quite different as well. And the level of violence, is, as other speakers have outlined, rose dramatically over 1921-22. Um, and whereas, as Robert Lynch has noted, more people were killed in Belfast during the truce period of July, December 1921, and they've been killed in the first half of 1921, the first half of 1921 being the most lethal period of the War of Independence in the South. And then, if, as, as I think some of the other speakers have drawn attention to, there was the, the May 1922 saw an offensive by most of the IRA across the northern counties, um, with the exception of the 4th Northern Division. But, and that, again, was followed uh, in June by Aiken and, and others carrying out the notorious attacks on Protestant families in Alt Levee, uh, which a number of the Northern Bureau witnesses condemn unreservedly. Um, so the view, basically, that Northern witness statements should also cover the, what, what, what one witness called the so-called truce period um, was shared by other Northern veterans, uh, such as John Grant. Um, I'll just read out one of, one of these quotes here. Uh, Grant said, it would be impossible to give an historical account of the events in our area without anything pertaining to completeness and stop at 11th of July, 1921 an account stopping that would not record half of the events that took place during a very troubled period and would be useless in a, as an historical document. Um, now, John McCoy had taken the anti-treaty side, but many others uh, from the Belfast uh, Battalion and other parts in the north, such as um, Roger McCorley and, and Seamus Woods, basically felt that the treaty had been the, was the best deal available at the time, even though they didn't like it, and they accepted it as a tactical move on the advice of, of Owen O'Duffy and others. Uh, uh, but although they later became disillusioned, and as I said before, many Northern veterans went south and joined the I Irish Army. Um, but, you know, and as I said, from a purely military perspective, the, you know, the Bureau of Witness Statements have been mined pretty extensively by other historians, but I kind of just want to, for the last part of the talk, uh, look at the statements from a, a slightly different perspective, because Thus far, anyway, Bureau statements are rarely used as sources for social history, but I think they really should be, because although the Bureau was collecting military history, witnesses were essentially allowed to include whatever details of their, li of their lives they felt was, was relevant. And so that many witnesses include descriptions of their childhood and their families or the history of their area. And these individual collections, recollections often have a vividness that's rarely conveyed in more conventional sources. For instance, I'm just going to give you uh, 
read out a passage from the, the witness statement of Thomas McNally, who was a colonel in the Irish Army when he gave his statement. And this is his description of growing up in Belfast. It's very long. I'm not going to read all of it. I'm going to read the beginning and then jump to the end. Uh, and this is his description of the riots he experienced during the marching season, which, as A.C. Hepburn has noted, was a regular feature of Belfast life over the 19th and early 20th century. And this is what he says. These battles were a lesson in tactics. The police, undoubtedly men of courage and usually outnumbered, had not received anything but drill yard instructions. The rioters were in the main corner boys who had, in many cases, received military training in the British Army. The streets were paved with the small egg-shaped stone, colloquially known as pickers, which I think in one of, the, one of the photographs that was just shown by the last speaker was what those are. Um, the area was like a rabbit warren, streets of small houses built back to back, crisscrossed each other in a fairly regular formation. The interior streets were barricaded and the women of the area dug up the pickers and left them in heaps to be used as ammunition by the menfolk. The police, armed with baton, battens, were goaded on to charge and when they reached the barricades were usually met with a fusillade of pickers. On retreating they were showered with stones from the adjoining houses. Ultimately, the soldiers would be called out. On one occasion, I remember as a boy seeing a unit of the Hussars in action. And then he goes on to describe what they did um, and the reaction to some of the local population to them. And he ends on this, he says, these then were the conditions under which a great majority of the Belfast youth were reared, an unreasoning hatred of Protestants, a detestation of the police, and a more or less neutral fe feeling towards soldiers. Now, I mean, and that's kind of the sort of thing that you might expect somebody like a, a Belfast IRA man to say, but overall, what's one of the interesting things about the statements is actually attitudes towards Protestants and unions, unionists and the Orange Order is actually very diverse, much more diverse than you might expect. And one of the things that the witness statements suggest is that this, uh, the sort of experience had by McNally, was, or the sort of experience that you had, was to some extent dependent on your social background. And, and what is interesting is how much McNally's experience, for instance, contrasts with that of witnesses like Kevin O'Shiel from Tyrone or another uh, Belfast witness, Michael A. McConnell, who were from much wealthier backgrounds. Uh, and they had a, quite a different kind of, of contact with Protestants and unions, and both their mothers were, as they called, convinced Edwardians. Um, Shields' family was the only, were the only Catholic members of the Tyrone County Tennis Club, for instance, and his mother was completely obsessed with the, with the Queen. Um, and O'Shiel gives one of the longest states in the collection, and if, I mean, you should definitely read it. It gives a beautifully long and detailed descriptions of Tyrone life and of the areas of Fermanagh in the nor north and Antrim south where he unsuccessfully campaigned during the 1918 election. And he gives often very sympathetic portrayals of the unionist communities he encountered in those areas. Um, while McConnell uh, attended an Anglican primary school in Ballymena in County Antrim before he moved to Belfast. And his statement contains this fascinating passage describing how he put his experiences at that school to good use in later years. And this is what he says. After 1925, when I qualified in medicine, I did locums in Belfast, all in orange districts, for Protestant doctors. From time to time, such people as a husband of a wife in childbirth, childbirth would remark that the town was now quiet or something of that sort and would recount their experiences at their end, obviously taking me to be of the right sort. On one occasion in the summer of 1927, a father in Denmark Street, which runs down to Carrick Hill, where the Belfast fighting began, told me that the Fenians had intended to attack them, but that they had got in first. Again, a little earlier, there had been a revival in the Protestant areas, and I had, I had myself heard converted people giving testimony to the murders which they said they had committed at the time of the disturbances in Belfast. During the whole period from 1919 to the end of these disturbances, I was able to pass freely through the Orange districts, thanks to my knowledge of their reactions to the particular tone of voice I had learnt at my first school, and use such routes as shortcuts when passing from one battalion area to another when time was important. Now, I, I actually don't really, not, 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 not only not being from the North, but not even being Irish, I, I don't really know what he means about the particular tone of voice. I, I suspect that some of you in the audience might. Um, but I think uh, what, what makes O'Connell's statements 
important reading these because it gives us, first of all, a glimpses into his own experiences, which are quite different, but also a glimpse into life and a whole part of what happened in Belfast at that time that actually historians in general know far less about. Um, and that, and, for, and because, as, as we know, as far as I know anywhere, there, there is no equivalent to the Bureau of Military History that we, um, among loyalists or unionists. So a, a, a very large part of, of what they felt and what they experienced and what we did, we just know nothing about. Um, and, the, and the statements oftentimes gives little glimpses like this uh, into not only into, into the, the the background of the Republicans, but some of the people they encountered. And I think this is an aspect of the statements that should receive more attention uh, than it has up to now. Um, but just to, anyway, just to conclude now um, and to say a couple of final words about the Bureau. Um, I think like all sources and oral sources, Bureau statements are partial, they're not always accurate, and they sometimes contain deliberate omissions and, so, and sometimes even lies, so this characteristic of the statements has been greatly exaggerated. Um, but even these statements um, are valuable if they are understood as an opportunity to discover why the information one's looking for is not there, rather than just condemn them uh, for, for what isn't there. And, and, the, and even having said that, a lot of the information, and most of the information in the witness statements is actually very accurate, and that you really can't um, find anywhere else. And so I think that, that when you use individual testimonies like witness statements, it makes it easier to assess how the events were actually perceived by those who took part of them. And, it, and I, it enriches our understanding of the meaning and significance of those events in the years that followed. Um, the statements give numerous examples of how individual experience can often run counter to wider patterns of behavior and events. And also the fact that this, the witness statements have you know, a grassroots appeal, as well as, as being academically important. It gives, I think, an historian, historians real opportunities to get, engage with the public and also with popular interest in the past, um, but in a way that doesn't ne necessitate compromising a nuanced or a realistic approach to those events. That's it.